Hi, welcome to Telcom's Chemistry video, in which I hope to create a series of videos where we look to get 100% on GCC chemistry papers. This particular paper is going to be an IGCC at Excel 9 to 1 paper, but actually most of the content will be analogous to any GCC chemistry paper from any exam board, so the vast majority of this information will be relevant to any student. And my aim here, objective, is to give you the inside track on exam technique and how to give the best possible answers on these exam style questions for the whole paper, so you can get yourself 100% on a paper like this. Let's get started. Let's look at the first question. Potassium banganate is a purple solid that is soluble in water, will dissolve in water. The crystal of potassium manganate is placed into a beaker of water and this change occurs. After a short time, the crystal becomes smaller and the liquid at the bottom of the beaker becomes purple. Um, so which statement best explains those relations? That would be dissolving. The crystal is shrinking in size as the particles are being released into the water and that would best be described as a dissolving process and that would be B. The beaker is then left until no further change in appearance of the liquid occurs. Which statement best describes the final appearance of that liquid in the beaker? Well, that's going to be when the crystal of potassium manganate has completely dissolved into the water and all of the water, all of the liquid, will have then turned purple. Which process is causing this change in appearance? Well, that would be diffusion. The movement of particles from a high concentration to a low concentration along a concentration gradient until evenly distributed and that would create the purple uniform color throughout the whole of the beaker and so that would be diffusion which in this case would be c the formula of potassium permanganate is kmno4 how many different elements are there in potassium permanganate what we do here is we rewrite the formula down here and we look for how many different elements make up that formula? So the capitalized letter K, that's an element. The capitalized letter M, lowercase n, is the second element because any lowercase letter is part of the elemental symbol. And finally, oxygen, the capitalized O, that's our final element. So we count them up. Potassium, element one. Manganese, element two. Oxygen, element three. There are three different elements present in the formula of potassium manganate. That'll be A. And that brings us to the end of question one, four out of four. Let's now look at question two. The diagram shows parts of the product table of elements represented by the letters L, M, Q, R, and T. Letters in the diagram represent elements, but are not their chemical symbols. So they're just randomized letters. Give the letter from the diagram represents a noble gas. Well, if our knowledge of product table is correct, noble gases, the inert, unreactive gases, are found at the end of the product table in either known as group zero or group eight. That's here. So the only letter would work there is T. So that would be the right answer. Elements L and M are in the same group. State why they have similar chemical properties or chemical reactions. Well, that would be because they're, well, if we look at L and M, they're both in group one. They're both group one elements. Therefore, they're going to react in similar ways because of the fact that they're in group one and what that means. Um, they have similar chemical reactions as they have the same number of outer shell, or otherwise known as valence, electrons. And that's all to do with the basics of chemistry. Um, chemical reactions are underpinned by how many electrons in the outer shell of atoms in different groups, um, and therefore whether those electrons can be transferred in different ways. And finally, an atom of element Q has 31 protons. Use this information to explain how we can determine the number of protons in an atom of element R. And element R is two positions over from element Q. Well, the first thing we need to realize is how the periodic table is arranged. The periodic table is arranged in order of increasing atomic number. Every time you move one to the right in position, the atomic number increases by one. The second thing we need to realize is that atomic number is counting the number of protons found in the nucleus of any atom. So therefore, if we're going from Q to R, the atomic number will rise or increase by two. Therefore, 
that will be adding two more protons, 31 plus 2 equals 33 protons found in element R. So this question is all about knowledge of the periodic table. Okay, question three starts off looking like a chemical analysis question. A student does two tests on a solution made from a white solid. They do something called a flame test and then they add some acidified silver nitrate solution. The table shows the outcome of their results. Give the formula of the iron that produces the red flame. So in this particular syllabus, we have to learn some flame tests and the flame test color that corresponds with a red flame it is indicative of lithium ions. So what's present there is Li plus or lithium ions. Name the cream precipitate. The cream precipitate here being produced when we added acidified silver nitrate to the solution. That would imply that we had some bromide ions present because the silver ions in solution, the aqueous silver ions, interact with the aqueous bromide ions in the solution to form silver bromide solid. It's a precipitate, it's insoluble, and it appears as a cream solid. And that is called, it says name, not write the formula, silver bromide. The next question is drawing conclusions from our two observations to identify the white solid. Well, our first test has shown us that the solution and therefore the white solid must have contained lithium ions. And the second test is positive for the presence of bromide ions. So bring that together, if we have lithium ions and bromide ions present, that becomes the compound lithium bromide. And that's our answer. That's what the white solid must have been. Moving on, the next part seems to be about experimental technique. A student uses a clean metal wire to do a flame test. State why the wire should be clean when used in the flame test. This is about the, the presence of impurities and to remove those impurities. Because if you had any impurities present, they might confuse your observation of color and therefore your conclusion of result would be incorrect. So we're gonna write down that it was to remove any impurities. that could, if present, confuse or interfere with our observation and subsequent conclusion, which would be incorrect if the colors were confusing. Now we have a table that lists the properties of some metals. We have to add ticks to the table to show two properties needed for the metal wire used in the flame test. Now the trick here is that all four of these are possible properties of most metals, but only some of them are relevant to the flame test scenario. The flame test scenario, we're gonna be exposing the wire to high temperatures, and we don't really want the wire to be interacted with the substance we are utilizing and testing for. So I think the two bodies that match up best with the use in the flame test are the high melting point of the metal wire and the unreactive nature of the metal wire, probably a nichrome um, alloy in this case, so it doesn't interfere or, or affect the observation we're looking for in our flame test. The next question is looking at the separation technique known as chromatography. Now students using this apparatus to investigate the colors of four different inks, A, B, C, and D, give two mistakes the student made when setting up the experiment. Now, if we look at the diagram, two things really draw my eye. Firstly, that the water level, the solvent level, is above the line drawn with the ink spots put onto it. And secondly, the baseline itself has been drawn in ink. Now, both of these are very definitive errors in the experiment technique, and I'm gonna take you through both those errors and why they are mistakes, and maybe even how to correct them. So mistake one, that the water level was above the ink spots. Now that's a problem because if we leave it like that, the soluble ink spots, because they will be so, ideally soluble in the solvent chosen, the soluble ink spots will simply dissolve into the solvent itself. Rather than rise up the paper as intended. And mistake number two is the baseline being written or drawn in ink 
rather than in Ideally Pencil. So let's go through that. So the ink may well also be soluble in the chosen solvent and would, or could, my better way of thinking, could run up the paper, the chromatography paper, along with your pigments, so as well as your ink spots, creating confusion. Confusing your results. So what's the solution to this problem? Use a pencil, because the graphite in the pencil is insoluble in water. Okay, so use a pencil instead, because the graphite pencil can draw a line which is insoluble in water and won't affect your result. In part B, another student does the same experiment but does not make any mistakes. And this is her result. Stay how many colors ink D contains. Let's have a look at ink D. So ink D was placed here. And now at the end of the chromatography experiment, we can see that three separate colored pigments have been separated out. So it would appear that that's how many colors ink D was comprised of, three. The next question asks, which inks tested could be mixed together to make ink D? Well, if we look at the patterns presented, a has a corresponding identical pigment to D at the same level, which is this one here. And B has two pigments at the same level, which would therefore be identical to those found in D. So if we mixed A and B together, they give the same combination of pigments as those found in D. So the answer would be A and B, because together they have all the different pigments at the same levels as those found in D itself. And finally, which of these inks tested might have been itself insoluble, not dissolving in water? Well, if we look back at our diagram, we can see that C, the dot, the original ink spot for C just hasn't moved, which would imply that it was insoluble. So the answer is C, and why? It's because the original ink spot, the one they placed down in the first place, hasn't moved, implying that it is insoluble, does not dissolve, in the chosen solvent. In this case, it was water, wasn't it? And that takes us through some of the key aspects of the separation technique known as chromatography. Moving on. Question five is kind of a general knowledge question in multiple aspects, but has a historical context as well. In 1937, an airship full of hydrogen gas flew from Germany to America. I imagine we're talking about the Hindenburg here. Which property of hydrogen makes it a suitable gas for use as an airship? Well, airships, they float in the sky. So therefore, the most appropriate property which links to that aspect of airships is the low density aspect, le less dense than the air around it. Uh, explain why helium is now used for airships instead of hydrogen. Well, again, if you know the historical context here, the Hindenburg disaster was caused by the flammable nature of the hydrogen. So let's bring that in. Okay, first of all, hydrogen is a flawed gas to choose because it is highly flammable. So why is helium better? Well, again, let's use our knowledge of the periodic table. Helium is a group eight or group zero element. It's a noble gas, and we know in terms of the properties of those elements, the noble gases are inert and unreactive. So helium is an unreactive, another word for that is inert gas. And therefore, the key thing it brings is safety. It is a safer gas to use because it's going to be less likely to um, have that flammable aspect or explode if something goes wrong with a spark or a, or a lightning strike or something like that. The next question says, hydrogen is used to manufacture ammonia, which is used in the production of fertilizers. Hydrogen is reacted with nitrogen using an iron catalyst. Give a chemical equation for this reaction. Two ways you can approach this, either from general knowledge and experience of chemistry, you may already know the equation for the Harbour process, or you can piece it together from the names. Hydrogen makes you think of the formula H2, because that's the formula of the molecule hydrogen. Nitrogen gives me the formula N2, and then it's a balancing equation problem because those are our reactants and our product. So we've got H2 reacting with N2 to form our product, 
which is ammonia NH3. Now, in reality, this is a reversible reaction. If you know that, no problem throwing that in. Okay, and then we come to the balancing. We can see two nitrogens on the left-hand side, only one currently on the right-hand side with the ammonia molecule. So you multiply that by two. So that becomes two nitrogens. But of course, that multiplying number affects everything in the molecule, including the hydrogens. Two times three equals six hydrogens on the right-hand side, only two on the left-hand side of the arrow with the hydrogen molecule. If we multiply that hydrogen molecule by three, three times two is six. Six hydrogens, six hydrogens, two nitrogens, two nitrogens. That's a perfectly balanced equation, and that's our answer. Finally, state why a catalyst is used in this reaction. A basic question about the about the uh, understanding of catalysts generally. Okay, so what do catalysts do? Not what the how, not explaining how they work, just what they do. Catalysts are substances which increase the rate of chemical reactions without being changed permanently or used up by those chemical processes. So it's very important because this is a more descriptive question rather than an explanation question. We have to explain what catalysts or how they work. That's a different, um, different answer to this one. Question six is a look at the reactivity series. The reaction of metals with water and with dilute acid can be used to determine the order of reactivity for metals. The table shows reactions of four metals called W, X, Y, and Z with water and with dilute sulfuric acid. Okay, very important we said they were dilute there rather than concentrated. And we can see that we're being asked to work out the order of reactivity of these metals and map it against the four options. Seems to me that Z seems to be the most reactive with both water and sulfuric acid. Next would be X, which reacts quickly with sulfuric acid but only slowly with water. Then we've got Y, which only reacts with dilute sulfuric acid. And then finally W, didn't react with either. And so the order of activity which matches that or those observations is definitely B. Now for question B, both I and II are based on your experiences of experimental observations from maybe key stage three or your GCSEs as well. Stay which metal out of W, X, Y, and Z could be copper. So it relies on actually remembering what copper did when you tried to react with water and with dilute acids. So if you draw back for your memories, you should remember that copper is so unreactive, it didn't react with either water or dilute acids themselves. It didn't react with either. And so which letter corresponds with not reacting with water and not really reacting with dilute acids either? That would be, looking at the letters we've got available to us, W. Then it says, stay which metal W, X, Y, Z could be magnesium. Again, think about your experimental experience of using magnesium. Magnesium barely reacts with cold water, very slowly reacts with cold water. You might see the odd bubble on the surface of the magnesium, but not much else. You need to react magnesium with steam, you know, gaseous water to get a much more vibrant reaction. Um, but if you put magnesium in acids, from your acids topic knowledge, you will see fizzing as hydrogen gas is rapidly generated. So Mg does fizz rapidly with dilute acids. So with those observations in place, which letter would correspond with that? Well, it's not actually gonna be Z, that'd be too reactive. It's probably gonna be X because it reacts quickly with dilute sulfuric acid. So our best option there would be X. The final part of question six is looking at displacement reactions. A displacement reaction can be used to decide an order of activity for two metals. State the observations, what you'd see or experience made when an excess of magnesium powder is added to a aqueous solution of copper sulfate. So this is an example of a displacement reaction where a more reactive element takes the place and replaces a less reactive element and therefore displaces a less reactive element from its compound. What I, what I do here is I think about what the reaction actually is and then go from there. So we have magnesium powder reacting with copper sulfate to form in the displacement reaction, the more reactive magnesium is gonna take the place of the less reactive copper in that compound magnesium sulfate and copper metal is displaced out. Now, now we can think about what you'd see when that's happening, because magnesium powder is kind of gray in appearance, a gray solid. 
Okay, copper sulfate is a beautiful blue solution. That's our starting colors. But magnesium sulfate is effectively a colorless solution. Uh, it has no color at all. And copper, if you remember what copper looks like, is kind of an orangey colored metal, orangey pink colored metal. So what we see happening as this reaction progressed, I'm going to just move my one down here. The first thing we'd see is that solution color change. Uh, the solution would change color. That's too vague though. I want to say specifically what color changes. Change color from uh, from blue, sorry, from a blue solution to a colorless solution. That's the change from copper sulfate to magnesium sulfate. The second observation we'd see, okay, would be the solids, okay? The gray solid, which is magnesium, would change color to become a orange solid. And that's the displacing out of the copper to give that observation over time. That is a displacement question solved. Now, question seven is a bit more chunky, longer answer questions looking at structure and bonding. Diamond, graphite, and silicon dioxide are all classified as giant covalent structures, regular repeating lattice structures with covalent bonding between the non-metal atoms. The diagrams show the structures of these three substances, got diamond, graphite, and silicon dioxide. Um, now, explain why silicon dioxide has a high, relatively high melting point. Really focus your answer on the covalent bonding and the nature of covalent bonding. So throughout this giant lattice structure, about this regular repeating pattern for silicon dioxide, there will be many, many, beyond billions of individual covalent bonds. Let's just use the word many every time for simplicity. There will be many strong, really emphasize the fact these are strong bonds, strong and what type of bonds as well. Many strong covalent bonds throughout that lattice, that giant lattice structure, throughout the giant covalent lattice, regular repeating pattern, structure. That's our first point, the statement is fact. And then the second statement is always the implications in terms of melting point, focusing on this high melting point, which requires a certain type of energy to overcome. So our second bullet point would always be, this is going to require large, that is a G, <laughs> sorry, large, better, amounts of heat energy to break or overcome those strong covalent bonds. Double emphasizing the covalent bonds just to make sure I've got the right type of bonding. Really important not to use the wrong type of name of bond here. If you accidentally talk about arnic bonding or metallic bonding, you're going to nullify your marks instantaneously. Explain why graphite, okay, why graphite of the three conducts electricity, okay, and how it's different to the other two. We look at graphite, okay, three covalent bonds per carbon atom, one electron per carbon is not involved with covalent bonding, is therefore what we call a delocalized electron. And that's the important thing to focus on when we're talking about the conductivity of this giant covalent structure, specifically graphite, why it conducts electricity. Okay, so I'm actually going to emphasize all those things. There are three covalent bonds per carbon atom in this particular structure, which therefore means, this is the more important fact, there will be one delocalized, that's free moving, able to move, delocalized electron per carbon atom. Okay, it has each carbon atom throughout this massive giant covalent structure will have one delocalized electron available. And those delocalized electrons are able to move or flow throughout the giant covalent structure, or along the giant covalent structure, between the layers effectively, it's like a highway for electrons, so are able to flow or move throughout the giant covalent structure, and that will conduct an electrical current. So really focusing on this delocalized electron answer, 
one delocalized electron per carbon atoms, lots of delocalized electrons are able to flow and move throughout the giant covalent structure of graphite. Finally, state why diamond is the hardest naturally occurring substance, whilst graphite, comparatively, is much, much softer. Uh, graphite, by the way, is the substance used in pencils, and it is really soft because you can leave a layer of graphite, many, many layers of graphite, on the page when you write with a pencil. But why is that? Bit of a long answer here, guys, but I'm going to try and do it as quick as I can. So let's focus on graphite first of all. So uh, graphite, you can see it here, has layers of covalently bonded carbon atoms, but between those layers are only weak forces of attraction. So graphite only has weak forces of attraction between the layers, those layers of covalently bonded carbon atoms. And those that means layers can slide off each other very easily. You can leave behind multiple layers with not much force required. Okay, on the other hand, diamond forms four strong covalent bonds. One, two, three, four. Four strong covalent bonds per carbon atom. This leads there to be many strong covalent bonds throughout lattice structure. Okay, so loads of bonds to break. Um, and it's going to take a uh, requires. Oops, I'll move this up a little bit. Requires a lot of force or energy to overcome all these strong covalent bonds. Now, what you can see I've done here is over answer this question because I'm looking for one hundred percent. I'm looking for redundancy. I'm looking for no possibility that I can't hit the brief of the mark scheme. So these are extensive answers given by uh, someone who knows what they're doing in terms of someone who's really done their revision really well. This is going to be over answer this question, but the point is we're really focusing on getting 100% and giving the best answers possible and showing off our knowledge as well. Okay, so this is not necessarily a textbook answer or, or mark scheme answer. This is a detailed answer. Question eight is our first foray into organic chemistry, the chemistry of carbon. Uh, the first question in this section is a balancing equation question. If they say complete the chemical equation, they actually mean the balanced symbol equation. Now I've shown the answer here, but I wanna show you how you get to this answer because this working quickly becomes quite confusing. So I'm gonna explain it one more time with a second version down here. And the first step is just to count up what you have in terms of atoms of different elements on the left-hand side and the right-hand side of the balanced equation. So I can see in terms of carbons, we have two hydrogens, we have four, Five on the right hand on the sorry left hand side, um, and uh, chlorines we have one, and uh, oxygens we have two, and that's the left hand side tied up. Whereas on the right hand side of the equation we have carbons two, hydrogens four five six, chlorines two, and oxygens one. So we can clearly see quite a lot of imbalance here in terms of the two sides of the equation. First thing I might want to do is try and turn this um, odd oxygen number into an even number and it might help balance things up a bit. So if I put a large coefficient two in front of this water, that would bring the oxygens up from one to two, matching the left-hand side. But it also has the effect of increasing the hydrogens, two times two being four plus four, up to eight. So we still have some problems in terms of imbalance there. So we've got to do something on this side to try and bring things up to the same level. Um, I think, again, the easy, the easy thing to start trying to work out maybe might be the chlorines, bringing those up and seeing if it has an influence on things. So if I put a um, two in front of this, I bring my chlorines up to two, two times one is two, and my hydrogens up from uh, five to six. Brilliant, but I'm still trying to get to eight overall, so that isn't really working. So I need to increase the amount of hydrogens um, 
probably on both sides try and solve this. I don't think it's going to be solved that easily just with uh, changing one side. So I'm going to see what happens if I increase this up by multiplying all of this by two and give me some more room to work. So I have two times two, which is four carbons, two times four, which is eight, nine, 10, 11, sorry, uh, four times two, which is eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 hydrogens. Um, we have uh, two times two, which is four chlorines. And my oxygens is still uh, just two. Okay, so I can leave that on this side. This oxygen doesn't need anything done to it at all. But now I've got a bit more scope to work with my hydrogens on this side. If I multiply this by two, Okay, that would bring two times two is four. That's great. It's bringing my carbons up to the right level. Uh, two times four is eight plus two is currently ten. Not quite there with my uh, hydrogens. Uh, still, ah, see, two chlorines versus four chlorines. That's not going to work, but easily sold. If I multiply this up to four, well, let's see what happens now. Carbons hasn't changed. Hydrogens, four times one plus the eight becomes twelve sorted. Chlorines is now four times one, which is four, sorted. Oxygen's identical, and that would be our balanced equation. Now, the key thing to realize here, guys, is that's worth one mark. So it's quite labor intensive, quite a lot of work involved, quite a lot of arithmetic there. If you're struggling with time, one mark isn't gonna be worth it, but we're going for 100% of it, so it's worth doing this solution now. But if you're struggling with time, just put an asterisk on the side, move on and come back to this question later, and try and get that last marker at the last minute. Phew, moving on from that quite intensive balancing equation question for a GC student, uh, this next stage is known as a thermal decomposition reaction. What does thermal decomposition mean? Break that term into its two pieces. Okay, so thermal should be conjuring up the idea of heat or heat energy. Okay, so heat energy. And what does decomposition mean? conjure up in your mind as a word, as a term. Hopefully, the word that brings, bring, that brings to mind is breaking down. Decomposition being about breaking down. Uh, so a thermal decomposition is breaking down of a substance using heat energy. Okay, so breaking down a substance using heat energy. The diagram below shows a displayed formula, all the bonds shown, for chloroethene. State why chloroethene is described as an unsaturated compound in the context of organic chemistry. So this is a terminology question, a vocab question. What does unsaturated mean? Well, unsaturated molecules like this one have this, a carbon-carbon double bond. So an unsaturated molecule, such as this one, is any molecule that contains at least one. Only, more than one, still an unsaturated molecule, but at least one. At least one carbon-carbon double bond. Okay, that's what we mean by the term unsaturated. It changes the reactivity of the molecule. Describe a test shown to show, sorry, that chloroethene is an unsaturated molecule. What is the chemical test for unsaturated molecules? A simple, what we call wet chemical test can be done very quickly and easily. Um, all we do is we'd add bromine water, which is itself, if it's reasonably concentrated bromine water, an orange colour. And what should happen is, in terms of reaction, the saturated molecule will undergo a reaction with that aqueous bromine. Okay, so that's Br2Aq, by the way. So the, if you're taking our example here, our colourless alkene molecule will interact and react with our orange aqueous bromine water, taking up that bromine into this molecule, breaking the double bond in the process. And so I'll talk about what kind of reaction that is in a second. And that would leave us with this molecule here, where the bromine atoms have become part, incorporated into this um, haloalkane, this 1,2-dibromoethane uh, molecule. And this molecule is colourless. So what we're looking for, so we add bromine water to an unsaturated molecule, what we're looking for is a colour change from orange, which was the original bromine water, to colourless, once that bromine water has reacted with the alkene to form this new product, which is a, called a haloalkane. Name the polymer formed from chloroethene. So polymer, poly means many, mer means pieces. Basically a polymer is formed when many, many monomers of this molecule break open the double bonds, join to each other to form a long continuous chain. So the name of that would be 
basically many, the original name of the monomer. So we call it poly, which means many, chloroethene, because it's many, it was formed when many monomers of chloroethene join together. So it's called polychloroethene. It's going to jump on to the next question. Right, guys, on the question nine, which starts off with something called the empirical formula. Halon-1301 is a compound used in some fire extinguishers, and Halon-1301 has the percentage composition by mass of carbon being 8.05% of its mass, bromine being 53.69% of its mass, and fluorine comprising 38.26% of its mass. Show by calculation that the empirical formula of the compound corresponds to be CBrF3. Okay, so this is an empirical formula. We're going to use something called the grid method to solve this. First thing is you write the elements from the question in, th in different columns. In this case, three different columns for three different elements. Take either the mass or percentage by mass from the question and place it in the second part of our grid. So 8.05, 53.69% 53, and 38.26. You can use mass and percentage totally interchangeably because they effectively have the same function in this calculation. AR stands for the relative atomic mass of the elements taken directly from the project table. That's the top number corresponding with the same thing as the mass number in some respects um, for the elements in the project table. We're using relative atomic mass and mass number kind of interchangeably here, but they have slightly different meanings in reality. Um, so we're going to have 12, 80, and 19. Have a look at the project table to confirm those. Then we're going to work out moles. Moles is equal to the mass divided by the relative mass of the elements, the mass in grams, divided by the relative mass of the element involved. So we have 8.05 divided by 12, um, 53.69 divided by 80, and 38.26 divided by 19, which equals, each time, uh, this one equals uh, 0 0.671. This one also equals 0 0.671. We did our calculation. This one comes out as 2.01. Okay, those are our number of moles of carbon, bromine, and fluorine, respectively. Next, we do something called the molar ratio. I.e., we divide each of these by whichever one has the smallest number of moles to compare these values against each other as a magnitude of size. This one's three times larger than that one, for example. So if we divide 0 0.671 by the smallest number, which is, is happens to be 0 0.671 as well, we get one. It's it is the smallest number. Similarly, this is going to be identical because it also is. 0.671. Okay, we divide the fluorine mole number, which is 2.01 by 0.671. We get the answer three, which implies there's three times as much fluorine in this molecule compared to the amount of bromine or carbon, respectively. Okay, um, and so what in program form does that generate? Well, for every one carbon or bromine, we expect to find three times as much fluorine. In other words, CBrF3, and you should find that that matches. The expected answer for the question. Fabulous. This this marking this working sorry will will appear uh, as we carry on through the question. Ace. Carrying on to B, the diagram shows the displayed formula or the bond shown for a molecule of halon 1301. Draw a dot and cross diagram to show all of the outer electrons in this molecule. So we're doing a dot and cross diagram. Outer shell electrons shown for the molecule above, okay? The way I approach it usually is I try and visualize the atoms I'm gonna use, and then I overlap my Venn diagram to create the dot and cross diagram. So bromine, being a group seven element, has seven electrons in its outer shell. I'll draw a little dot and cross diagram, or a dot diagram for that. Now fluorine is also a group seven element with seven electrons in its outer shell. I'm gonna draw those as circles as well, because I can join those on to my centralized carbon atom in just a second, and I have three of those to play with. And finally, carbon as a group four element has four electrons in its outermost shell. Now, a good trick here is to go around singly before you pair up electrons. So you can see you've got four opportunities to create pairs and therefore covalent bonds, shared pairs of electrons. So to draw my overall dot and cross diagram, draw my central carbon atom with its four available electrons to create my covalent bonds, matching up with the, the appearance of the um, displayed formula given to me, which is helping me to complete this correctly. And then I'm going to put my bromine in the same position over here, my fluorines in the same positions as the dot and cross diagram, as the displayed formula above, and then overlap the shells. Okay, so we've got those overlapping uh, atomic orbitals. And finally, bring in those electrons, making sure that the circles I want to share are in the sharing area I've created for the fluorines. I'm going to do them as 
uh, filled in dots so you can see them more clearly and for the bromine then neatness not particularly important here as long as it's in the sharing area that's fine and the second mark is for making sure you remember to finish off the electrical configurations for all the atoms so they have filled outer shells often forgotten by students in a rush to complete these questions so quite important we uh we do that okay so here we go um brilliant moving on now the final part of this question is about the boiling point of halon 1301 which is particularly low at minus 58 degrees centigrade now whenever you're faced with a low boiling point scenario you should be thinking molecules you should be thinking simple molecular or simple covalent structures and this is the point when you can correctly use the term intermolecular forces okay so this halon molecule is an example of a simple covalent structure and therefore there are only going to be weak intermolecular forces inter meaning between international flight between nations for example weak intermolecular forces between the little molecules. These weak intermolecular forces are overcome relatively easily with the application of little heat energy compared to giant covalent structures, which are breaking covalent bonds. Overcome easily with little heat energy required. Amazing. Question 10 is returning to the realm of organic carbon-based chemistry. The first question is, state what is meant by the term isomers. So isomers is a key term from organic chemistry, and it means molecules that have the same molecular formula, i.e. they have the same numbers of different atoms, of different elements, carbons and hydrogens in the example. So same molecular formula, but a different structural arrangement. The arrangement of those carbons and hydrogens will differ from each other. We're then asked to draw the displayed formula, or the bond shown, for another isomer of C5H12, which is not the original linear pentane molecule. Now the key trick to this is to make sure what we're drawing has a different chain length. different carbon central chain length. Because the most common mistake students make is they'll just put some kinks and angles on this pentane molecule and think they've drawn an isomer, but actually not only does it have the same molecular formula, it actually has the same structural formula. It's just simply uh, reading in a different way. It's just simply running in a different course. But we need to draw a genuine structural isomer that has a different structural arrangement from this pentane molecule. So let me show you what I mean. So I'm gonna draw a different isomer which is four carbons in length with a branching methyl group coming off of this second carbon. Okay, now how can I prove to myself that that is a genuine isomer of pentane and is not just the pentane molecule drawn again? Well, the proof in the pudding is I can run my finger along the chain in pentane all the way from carbon one to carbon five without removing, removing my finger. I mean, it's a continuous chain of carbons. If I try and do that with the molecule I've drawn here, this isomer, I can only run my finger along the first four carbons. And I have to physically remove my finger to count that branched carbon. It's a four carbon chain rather than a fine carbon chain, but it still has the same numbers of carbons and hydrogens as this pentane molecule here. This isomer would be called 2-methyl, because the methyl group's on the second carbon, got my hydrogen there, sorry, 2-methyl butane. Okay, same number of carbon and hydrogens, different structural arrangement. The other isomer I can draw is like this, okay? One, two, three carbon chain, carbon above and below the middle carbon in the chain, add on all my hydrogens. And again, I can prove to myself, this is definitely a different chain isomer, different structural isomer to pentane by running my finger along the chain, the longest continuous chain. I can only get as far as three. I have to remove my finger to count the branching 
uh, pieces there and there. Or oh, I could go this way, one, two, three, can't go any further. Count the branches either side. This would be called 2,2-dimethylpropane. And these are the two chain isomers and structural isomers of this pentane molecule. And finally, part B, pentane reacts with bromine in the presence of UV radiation, ultraviolet radiation, high energy um, UV uh, electromagnetic spectrum radiation. Um, complete the equation for this equation. So this is a different reaction to the unsaturated alkene molecules, which are undergoing an addition reaction to take up that bromine at room temperature. This is only happening for this saturated pentane molecule in extreme conditions. And the type of reaction taking place this time, which we'll come to in a second, is a substitution reaction. Effectively, we're going to substitute in one of the bromines and substitute out one of the hydrogens to form the products. So if we substitute out a hydrogen, replace it with a bromine, the formula becomes C5H11Br, one hydrogen out, one bromine in. And what's left over, the molecule left over, will be a hydrogen bonded to a bromine, hydrogen bromide. So we've substituted in one bromine and taken out one hydrogen to form these products. Name the type of reaction taking place. Oh, at A-level, we call it a free radical substitution. But at GCC, we just call it a substitution reaction. Because just like in football, you have substituted in one player, in this case bromine, and substituted out one player, in this case hydrogen, to form our products.